Hello, everyone. It's uh, Monday, June the 8th. Uh, I first got to start with something that, uh, you know, we've gone over the weekend. We did lose two other individuals. I think we lost these individuals on Friday night. They were a 75-year-old male from Berkeley County and an 84-year-old female from Pendleton County. Uh, you know, I... I it just sounds like a broken record, but uh, 84 deaths is 84 too many. If you look at the number, it is phenomenal how good the number is compared to other states. But it is not good if one of those 84 deaths is from our state or one of those surely is from your family. Please keep these people in your thoughts, your prayers. Kathy and I will do exactly the same thing. And just remember just one thing. The last thing on earth we want to have happen with great West Virginians that we've lost in this terrible killer pandemic is them to become a statistic. What we need always is to remember just the contribution that they made to this great state and to each and every one of us, and we thank them for it. Please, again, keep their families and all their loved ones and all their friends in your thoughts and prayers. Now, I want to lead off today by saying, you know, telling you about a conversation that I had just a little while ago. When I left my house this morning, there was an individual that had called and said there was a little seven-year-old boy that was uh, in one of our foster care facilities, the Greenbrier Valley Children's Home at Rupert, and uh, his name is Landon. And he would just love if there's any way that you could call him on the phone. Well, I said, well, of course I'll call, you know. And, and not only will I call, but I'll write him a note. And so I wrote him a note, you know, in my driveway and gave it to the individual. His name's John Sams. And John was going to take that over to the, to, I'm sorry, I didn't say, I, I, I said nursing home, but it's a foster care home. And I don't know if I said that correctly just a second ago. But nevertheless, uh, so John takes off with that, you know, the note that I had written to Landon, and I start driving, and I call him on the phone. Now, just think about this. Here's a little seven-year-old boy. You know what he wanted to call me about? He wanted to call me to tell me how great a job that the governor's doing and looking out for the people of West Virginia. You know, uh, and I'm going to have a hard time with this because I could get uh, really choked up about this. But one of the first things that he said, you know, like I said, here's a little seven-year-old kid that supposedly watches our briefings all the time. One of the first things he said to me was, uh, Governor Justice, will you please find a home for me? Now listen, and let me just tell you, you know, uh, we got too many foster kids that need homes. I went on to talk to him more, and he's being relocated. But as I understand it, Landon is still looking for a permanent home. Well, I'm asking all West Virginians to search your soul and see if, if just one great family could, uh, could think about Landon and all of our foster kids as well. Later on in the conversation, Landon said, you know what I want to be? And, what to eat? and I said, what's that, Landon? And he said, I want to be a doctor. Honest to Pete, you think about a seven-year-old kid that is watching our briefings every day and wants to thank me. Are you kidding me? I mean, really and truly, uh, we as West Virginians need to know just how desperate our foster care family situation is and how great a job that all those that are working in our foster care communities like the people 
that I just mentioned at the Greenbar Valley Children's Hospital home, you know, I talked with one of the workers there and she was helping me because Brandon would get so excited that I couldn't understand what he was saying because I, you know, I don't hear the greatest anyway. And so, but I told him there, you know, on the, on the call, I said, Brandon, not only are you a superstar now, or, or Landon rather, not only are you a superstar now, but as you go through your life, you will become such a superstar, it will be unbelievable. I told him I was really, really proud of him, and I am. And I'm really, really thankful for the call because it made my day, but also it should enlighten us all of a need that we have in West Virginia, and please, please, let's address the need. In the last legislative session, we did a lot, but if it's not enough, we've got to continue to do more. We got too many kids that need homes. We got a lot of great foster care parents that are really doing a great job. And we got a lot, a lot of workers that are in the foster care community that are doing absolutely fabulous work. So I thank them. And, and Landon, you just hang tough. I told him to watch the briefing today and I told him I'd mention his name. I didn't tell him I'd talk about him this much, but uh, they said on his last day, he's getting ready to be moved. And on his last day, he's going to have brownies and ice cream and some kind of strawberry type drink you know that he that I, I don't know exactly what it was but but anyway I'll be in touch Landon and, and uh, thanks for the call uh, I want to switch channels just a, a second and and brag on you West Virginians one more time you know Today, at 11 o'clock this morning, I was on a call with the vice president. You know, it's a weekly call. All the governors are on the call. They, they talk all the time. You know, New Jersey may say, we got our positive test under 10% now. And, you know, in fact, New Jersey had even a better positive test today than that. But, you know, and then they'll have someone talk about, you know, that they opened a summer camp or did this and everything else. And... Finally, here's what I said to him, and this is exactly what I said on the call. I said, Vice President Pence, I really thank you. I thank President Trump. I thank for all those within your staff and administration for all the work that you've done in trying to handle this situation. And now you've got, you know, I think, in excess of 110,000 deaths in the country. But let me tell you about a miracle that has happened right here in West Virginia. The West Virginia miracle is just simply this. We don't have oceans or great lakes on our borders. We are sitting right in the middle of the hotbed with border counties all the way around our state. I said, we're within a rock's throw of two thirds of the population of this country. We have a total number of deaths in our state right now of 84. We're the most vulnerable, the highest risk, the most chronic illnesses, the oldest, and we have 84 deaths. A 1.92 yesterday cumulative positive to total test number. It's really unbelievable. We were one of the first in the nation to, to shut down our schools. We were absolutely first in the nation as far as denying, uh, 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 stopping visitation at our nursing homes or absolutely testing our nursing homes or first in the nation on assisted living testing. We do not have one single death in any of our correctional facilities. And yet, on top of that, our economy and this state is still on solid ground. Now... We have had multiple protests and people exercising their right of free speech, but I know of no violence. I know of no violence thus far in the state. You know, the bottom line is, Mr. Vice President, I thank you 
and I thank the president, but truly, if all the states that are on this call and all the people could just hear my voice to what West Virginians have done, nearly two million of us, and look at what has happened right here in West Virginia, we are the example of exactly the goodness that has come, and we are the very place that all of you should come to. And that's exactly what I told them, because I am so proud of what West Virginians have done. You are pitching the greatest numbers on the planet. You absolutely are. You are still solidly uh, on solid ground economically, and as far as how you've handled this horrendous situation you know, that happened to George Floyd, you have handled it with grace and dignity and respect. You have handled it the greatest. You should be really, really proud, West Virginia, and I thank you for it. Now, if I could jump to just, you know, I'll read to you just a couple things, but today begins week seven of the West Virginia Strong, the comeback, reopening plan. Today, you know, we're going to, uh, we're going to, you know, start low contact sports practices, youth practices, the WVSSAC, athletics and band stuff is going on and all the guidelines are up there, whether it be little leagues, uh, you know, all the other stuff that's up there today, we're going, I mean, Wednesday, we're going to open our campgrounds, our state parks, uh, our private and state park campgrounds to, to out-of-state guests. Uh, you've got more guidance that's right up there. Uh, as far as uh, additional reopenings, I am announcing that summer youth camps may resume next Monday or, or Monday, June 22nd. And this applies to both camps and overnight camps. We will, have strict, we will have strict guidelines that will follow the CDC guidelines, and they are, I think they're coming out today, or they'll be published later on today. So we'll be following those guidelines. And uh, also today we're announcing that outdoor open-air concerts at fairs and festivals only will be allowed to resume when fairs and festivals resume on Wednesday, July 1st, with strict guidelines for safety. As far as our, uh, our cities and our counties that are applying for the monies from the CARES Act, we still in uh, anticipate millions of dollars of funding will be, re funding will be released this week. Uh, getting these funds out quickly to the cities and counties is a top priority, and I have our best revenue experts working on it nonstop. Uh, but we might, you know, everyone surely knows it's just as simple as this. It's not, it's not an open book. You know, we still have to uh, follow guidelines, but the guidelines have been, have been relaxed. And uh, today we've got 37 applications in. We want more and more and more, and we'll get those dollars out as fast as we possibly can per the guidelines. Okay, as far as the additional testing that's going on, we have additional testing for the minorities, uh, you know, especially the African-American community and all the vulnerable West Virginians. It's uh, it, this Friday and Saturday, June the 12th and 13th, we'll be in Greenbrier, Hancock, Logan, and Wood counties. Also on Saturday only, we'll be in Grant, Hampshire, and Hardy counties. So one more time, Friday and Saturday, Greenbrier, Hancock, Logan, and Wood, and on Saturday only in Grant, Hampshire, and Hardy counties. And it'll all be, it's all free testing. I encourage everyone to get out and participate. The more data you give us, the better off we'll all be. I want to give you an update on our jails, on our enhanced testing in, in, initiative at our correctional facilities. The Division of Corrections remains on track to expand enhanced testing to all facilities by June the 12th. As of this morning, there are four jails with a positive case. Each facility has only one positive case at this time. They are the Eastern, Northern Central, Potomac Highlands, and Tigret Valley. 
Each of them have one positive test. We are quarantining quarantine those people, and we're on top of it, and our people are doing their job and doing what they ought to be doing. Uh, there are two prisons with positive cases still out there. That's Huttonsville and Martinsburg. Uh, there are no cases at any of the juvenile centers or community correction centers. There are no positive cases there. All the positive inmates at the correctional facilities are in good condition at their facilities and in isolation. There's no new positive cases uh, among the employees. And the enhanced testing you know, results are being posted on our COVID-19 website. Okay, our summer feeding map project announcement. I want to remind you about our new West Virginia Strong Summer Program Assistance in Interactive Map. There it is right there. I think there's 600 sites where we'll be, we'll be able to, to, uh, to get out food to people in need. You know, the, the, the National Guard, the Department of Education, the Bureau of Senior Services, VOAD, and the United Way are all going together. It's a perfect example of how agencies working together to make real goodness happen and everything. And if you've got any question as to where you should go or what, you know, your location and all that kind of stuff, please dial 211 and talk to someone there and they'll, they'll move you in the right direction there. Uh, I encourage everyone again about the census. It's really important that we be counted. And, uh, and I've got just a real quick other couple of, of announcements. Our rafting industry tells us that, you know, because water conditions have been high and everything else, that we need to increase the number of people that we can have in a raft and everything. It makes, it makes for a safer experience. And to tell you the truth, we're, we're going to go with, with what they tell us makes a safer experience. You know, we are, you know, we are pushing them in every way to try in every way they can to social distance and do all the things that they need to do. But this is an outdoor activity, and we absolutely want it to be safe and safe in every way. So we're, we're going to listen and, 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 and go with how the rafting people think is the very best way for people to enjoy this, this beautiful experience, it's unbelievable. And, not on to, and on top of that, you know, we want to do it in as, in, as, in as safe way as we possibly can. Only thing I've got left is tomorrow. Tomorrow we will not have a briefing. It's election day. I encourage everyone, it's our right to vote and absolutely get out. I think the weather's going to be pretty. Get out and let your vote be heard and everything. And again, thank you for so much for, for everything. And uh, and and I'm I'm gonna pass on to you guys. All right, thank you, Governor. First, let's go to Dr. Clay Marsh, our coronavirus czar. Well, good afternoon, and um, I want to reinforce a couple of things that the governor said. Um, how proud we are of all of the people in West Virginia. Uh, as you go to vote tomorrow, vote safely. Remember that there are three C's that we need to pay attention to. That is close quarters, that's being inside with other people, that's crowds and uh, constant contact. So people that you're stationary with. So as you go out to vote tomorrow, wear your mask and keep your distance uh, as much as you possibly can. Uh, it's an incredibly important right, and, and we want everybody to do it safely. Similarly, if you are using your voice to protest, we want to make sure that you are similarly protecting yourself. Remember, the um, root word of health is HAL, H-A-L, which is also the root word of HEAL, and holy and holistic, and it means whole. It means all together. So while we're connecting and working together to make West Virginia the safest place possible, remember that by taking care of yourself, you are protecting your neighbor, uh, the vulnerable people in our state, our healthcare workers, and you're helping West Virginia shine brightly as a beacon to others. So thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Marsh. Next, we'll go to the West Virginia DHHR with Secretary Bill Crouch and Dr. Kathy Slim. Good afternoon, everyone. 
just want to mention one uh, issue. As most of you probably noticed, our dashboard did not update this morning at uh, 10 a.m. Uh, there was a technical uh, glitch in terms of rerouting of uh, the system. Uh, that data that is now on, uh, live, uh, the dashboard came back up with the correct data at 11 minutes after, just a few minutes ago. Um, the uh, report that uh, we generally do with that, the, the press release with that will come uh, shortly, but we just now have the data to put that together. Uh, so we apologize for the delay on that, but the, the dashboard is now up to date. Thank you. All right, thank you. Major General Hoyer with the West Virginia National Guard is also joining us today and is available for questions. Once again, we're holding today's briefing with media members joining us virtually to practice good social distancing. The first questioner we have today is Brad McElhenney with West Virginia Metro News. Hi, Governor. Hi, everyone. It's election day tomorrow, of course, but we haven't had a debate of the Republican primary opponents, including the governor. Uh, the governor, a couple times you've said that you haven't even visited your campaign headquarters. We don't have a briefing tomorrow, so there's still time. Is it time to start campaigning? Oh, Brad, I, I don't, <laughs> I'm surely not going to be campaigning tomorrow. I'm going to go vote. And, uh, and, and from my standpoint, you know, I don't know how in the world, you know, you, you've been with me every day. The people of West Virginia have been with me every day. You've asked me every single question in known demand. I've tried to answer them and answer them as best I possibly could from the bottom of my heart. You know, I'm, uh, I'm going to continue to keep working and, 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 and you know, and, and trying to stay on top of all the matters of state. And uh, we'll let the election just play out, you know, and then keep moving forward. All right, thank you, Brad. Next, we'll go to Amanda Barron with WSAZ. Hi, everyone. Amanda Barron with WSAZ. Um, I was reading a report by the Independent Restaurant Coalition about how the majority of people that have filed for unemployment um, are in the bar and restaurant sector. I wanted to know if you had a chance today to talk with Vice President Pence about um, using that money for small business grants, Governor, to help um, the restaurant and bar owners um, get back on their feet and help those people to make sure they, they still have jobs. I mean, there's a lot of topics that come up on the discussion and everything, you know, but from the standpoint of, uh, uh, of the restaurants today and the bars, there was some discussion, not much, you know, but we all are really aware, really aware, you know, of the fact that just how, how important that our restaurants are and how much pressure that they've been under. The, absolutely, without any question, the bars, the restaurants, the hotel industry, uh, you know, uh, those, uh, so many of just the tourism type industry and everything from the beginning and everything, now it's just starting to open back up. Right off the, right the get-go, what happened is a lot, a, lot of, a lot of those businesses applied, you know, for the PPP, they got the money, you know, then they were encouraged like crazy to bring their employees back and, put, and pay their employees. Well, a lot of them did. And then, boom, they just burned right through the monies that they had and everything, and, and, and they still weren't open. And so, so you know, there's so many different things that, that, that are at play and everything, but as we continue to move forward here and everything, Amanda, we are looking, we are looking for any way in the world we can to help exactly those people, and we will. We will, you know, by the end of the day, those people will be helped, and, and they'll be helped either either from the state standpoint, they'll be helped from the federal government, they'll, you know, there's, there's, more, there's, more, there's more coming, that's for sure. All right, thank you, Amanda. Next, we'll go to Taylor Stuck with the Herald-Dispatch. Looks like we might have trouble connecting with Taylor. How about we go to Mark Curtis with Next Star Media. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to direct my question to uh, Drs. Slemp and Marsh. Uh, with the restart of um, Little League and non-contact sports and even some of the middle and high school athletic training, I know the adults get it. The kids always don't uh, on something like this. So what are you advising coaches, parents, and others to do in terms of social distancing? Should kids be wearing masks on a Little League field, even though they might be far apart? Uh, just give us some guidance on how people should proceed with these youth activities reopening today. 
Go ahead, Gav. Yeah. Um, I'd be happy to start a little bit with that and then have Clay follow up as well. Um, you know, we really have to, as a society, um, weigh these risk benefits and make these decisions together. And it really is time to begin moving forward. Um, so I think there are, we certainly have parents that are um, working closely with, with um, sports, sports coaches to really think about how do we do social distancing in the stands? How do we use masks in the stands? Um, I think most importantly, it's really critical for parents to be able to talk to their children about these issues and to help them understand what's happening. Um, and so there's actually been some great um, information over the weekend. There was a great program through Sesame Street and others talk about talking to kids about, about um, COVID-19 and the, the changes that are in, in the works. And so I think that is um, part of the, of the role that coaches play, parents play, um, that, that need to be able to really have a good conversation with their child, understand what's happening around them and help them comply with the same um, new rules of how we're operating today. Um, I'll let Clay speak a little bit more to some of the um, details of, of what he's thinking around this arena as well. Um, but I think it's an important piece that we work together with our coaches and our parents to, um, to really talk about what's happening and why the measures are in place that we do. Thanks, Kathy, and thanks, Mark. I'll just add very briefly that as we have given guidance before and the SSAC has as well, if you're around people closely that you don't live with, then wearing masks is good. But if you can stay distance, particularly outside and, and, and as the weather's warmer, the UV light from the sun is also a, a positive sort of impact on the COVID uh, viral spread. So be smart. Uh, we love that people are getting back out together. And, and as we said, these three C's still pertain. So if you're in a group that you can't separate from, then people should all be wearing masks. But if you can stay separated, or stay close to only people that you live with, that you are you know, in a nuclear family with or in a living situation chronically with, then it's fine not to wear a mask in my opinion. All right, thank you, Mark. Next, we'll go to Charles Young with WV News. Hi, this is Charles Young with WV News. Uh, Governor, last week you indicated that sometime in the near future, you're going to be you know, switching from a daily briefing format to a two or three times a week format. Um, could you give us a better idea of the timeline? And do you think that by doing that, uh, it will make it harder to get folks to take the, the pandemic and the precautions seriously? If you're not updating people on a daily basis, do you think people will follow the guidelines or will they just assume this is over? Thank you. Well, Charles, first and foremost, uh, I'll come every day. I, I have no problem with me coming every day. I just don't want, you know, uh, people to become lethargic with, with, with the briefing. I want, you know, as long as people are still really dialed into what we're saying here and everything, then continuing to come every day we will, you know. And, but if, if, if the numbers are such that all we're doing is just going over the same stuff and everything, then really and truly we could probably go to an every other day deal. But, uh, but that every other day is still a ways away. You know, I, I've already said other than the election day, you know, we'll be here every day, every day this week. And, uh, and, then, and then we'll just continue to see where we stand and, 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 and the number of people that are viewing and uh, the, the amount of information that's coming. And we'll watch the numbers. You know, if in fact the numbers begin to change and, and we have some flare-ups and so on like that, we'll be here every day with you. All right, thanks, Charles. Next, we'll go to Kenny Bass with WCHS. Hi, this is Kenny Bass with Channel 8 and Fox 11 in Charleston. Governor, have you given any more thought to the restrictions on hospitals and nursing homes as far as visitations? I know you said you'd be looking at them. So many families are waiting for the green light and if you could give something concrete, a date that you're shooting for, um, a zip code, uh, kind of a, an area where you think you might be making a decision, they say that would be helpful in planning to take care of their loved ones who are in nursing homes and also, frankly, scheduling hospital times because they want to be able to visit with the people that are being treated. Thank you very much. 
Okay, Kenny, I, I, you know, I, I met with uh, two of the principal nursing home people, you know, on Friday at uh, probably between 5.30 and 6 o'clock Friday evening and met with them over to Mansion and everything, you know, on this particular subject and everything. We, we had a lot of dialogue, a lot of talk. I'm waiting on them to come back to me with the guidelines and everything. We're going to do more work on it today, but absolutely, I, I you know, I hear, I hear all kinds of voices screaming out, and, and not real, not really to me, but I hear it, I hear it in my sleep, you know, to where, you know, a mom wants to see her children, and maybe she's in really bad health and everything, and, uh, or maybe she's really old, and, and her children surely want to see her. And the same with a dad, you know, or whomever it may be in one of our nursing homes, and there's, there's all kinds of steps that we're taking right now to where, you know, these, and this is, this is how the conversation went, you know, they're going to tell, you know, they're, they're going to give us their guidelines. We're going to give them our guidelines and everything, but, but it's going to have to work kind of this way to where people will, will call in, basically book a time and everything. You know, they'll, everybody will, you know, be checked and wearing masks and all that kind of stuff. We'll have a certain area of, of you know, in the nursing home where, where you can go and meet with your loved one, you know, a mom, a dad, whomever it may be there. And, and you know, and we'll, we'll limit the amount of visitorship to either one at a time or whatever it may be like that. But, but there's ways that we can do it and we're on it. And, and so if... Uh, if you'll just give us a couple more days, I think it may very well be that we'll shoot for Wednesday. When we come back on Wednesday, we'll have the guidelines and we'll have definitive dates that we'll be able to start doing that. And, uh, you know, and, and like I said, I'm, I know there's risk. There's always risk involved and, and, and everything. But at the same time, uh, you know, a, a lot, a lot, a lot of these families, if you don't watch out, are... are uh, going to lose their loved ones without being able to visit them, and, and that's really bad. So, so uh, nevertheless, uh, we're, we're working on it. We're really working on it. Thank you, Kenny. Next, we'll go to Paul Mullen with WCBC. Good afternoon, Governor Panel. Good afternoon, Landon. Governor, you have said we're okay as a state to get through June 30th, and you've been focused on that and talking to your economic folks. Have they given you any indication on how many businesses in West Virginia will not survive the pandemic, pandemic will not be able to make it back? And uh, what are your th feelings on uh, what the budget is going to look like post-July 1st? Well, first of all, I really appreciate you. I hope Landon's still on here and everything, because Landon, you're, you're getting reached out by, from the media, and that's really great stuff. But, uh, and thank you so much for doing that. But, but uh, as far as, as businesses not surviving and everything, I haven't gotten an, a, a, an update as, as far as what they think is businesses that won't survive. We're going to try like crazy to, to see that there's all businesses survive. But at the same time, you know, we know that this could, be a, this could very well have been a cannonball to the stomach and we may lose some businesses and everything. I'm sure we'll lose thousands of businesses across this country. But hopefully in West Virginia, we'll be able to help from the standpoint of the state. You know, the federal government is still coming with another a stimulus package. I feel certain that that's going to happen. I can't absolutely etch that in stone. I really believe the guidelines are such that we're going to be fine as a state. And the economics of the state going forward, forward I think, are going to be very good. So, so uh, I'm not just a cheerleader that's got pom poms and I'm rah rah on you. I'm, you know, I want to, I want to be a cheerleader and encourage you all the time. I don't want to sit here doom and gloom. I've said all my life, you know, if you're a stick in the mud, I want you away from me. That's all there is to it, because I want people around me that are enthusiastic and positive about where we're going and what we're doing, in everything. Because I truly believe that enthusiasm is really contagious. Now, with all that being said, though, we don't want to be unrealistic. 
and we want to absolutely control our enthusiasm that we don't get disappointed. You know, I believe, I really believe with all in me that there's more stimulus dollars coming, there's more easing of regulations or guidelines that's going to happen. And irregardless, though, to that, West Virginia is going to be just fine. And moving forward, we're going to continue to grow. And just like I said today to all those governors, I said to the, all the presidential administration, I said, West Virginia is where the miracle truly happened. And West Virginia there is the place that you should be. You should be with your manufacturing plants. You should be with absolutely your residences. West Virginia is the place you want to be. So we're going to be good going forward. That's all there is to it. I absolutely am very confident of that. All right, thank you, Paul. Next, we'll go to Steve Adams with Ogden Newspapers. Yeah, Steve Adams of Ogden Newspapers here. Uh, my question is going to be for the health people. Uh, I've gotten this question a couple times today. Uh, we are over just over two weeks out from the Memorial Day weekend. I know there are some that express some concerns uh, about people getting out and doing things. That was the first real big weekend. I think people had to do that under lessened uh, social distancing uh, uh, restrictions, uh, more businesses being open and the whatnot. So, Obviously, as we're heading into this week, uh, what are we expecting to see? Are we expecting to see uh, any substantial spikes anywhere? I know that's obviously being monitored for, but it would seem, at least so far, uh, the, the numbers coming in have been uh, been very, very good uh, as far as the stats go. But are we expecting any type of bump or looking for any type of bump for the Memorial Day weekend? Thank you. Clay, Dr. Marsh, you go, and then Dr. Schlemp or, or Secretary yeah. Crouch or anyone. Sounds good, Governor. Thank you. Well, I appreciate the question, and, and we certainly are paying close attention not only to those areas of the state that border other um, states, um, county, a lot of COVID activities we've talked about. But we're also uh, monitoring some of those areas that have seen a lot of out-of-state business, and and as is rightly um, uh, asked, we feel that about two to three weeks after the event happens is when we start to see expression of illness. And, and thus far, we have done well. Um, so we are very um, optimistic that uh, at least in part, the outdoor nature of the openings and the tourist attractions may be our friend. And certainly, uh, the governor's office has, has created a lot of very important guidance for the appropriate and safe opening of these businesses, which I, I think that our business leaders have been very committed to following. But as we go, we know that as people come back to West Virginia and come into West Virginia from other states with more activity, that will likely introduce COVID into some of the rural communities that may not have really had a lot of expression of COVID before. So while so far so good, and we're really uh, very much uh, uh, happy and grateful that we haven't seen big outbursts uh, and, and outbreaks in some of these communities, we are keeping a very, very watchful eye because we know that sometimes this person to person spread starts slowly kind of undercover and then it becomes expressed. So, so we're watching that, we're watching the RT values, the, the reproduction spread values in some of these areas. And, and you know, in, in a couple of the areas of the state, we're seeing uh, some increases in that R value. So we will continue to test and keep a close eye on, work with the local health departments and county health officers. Um, but so far, I think so good. Kathy? Um, sure, I think Clay has covered it well. We are monitoring a variety of things. Um, and I think the only thing I would add is that besides looking at geographic areas, we also are kind of looking at sectors and seeing as we open up different sectors, is there any area where we happen to be seeing um, increased numbers of cases or outbreaks? So um, thinking about work sites, churches, facilities, those kind of settings so that we can um, kind of see where there are themes and where we need to make sure that we um, enhance prevention measures or get the messages out of the importance of doing that. So. 
All right, thank you, Steve. Next, we'll go to Dave Mistich with West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Hi, folks. Um, I'm I'm taking a look at, at some of the data from from inmate testing uh, that was put out yesterday. I know the governor that you gave an update earlier, so these numbers might be a little bit different. Um, I'm still seeing, based on the numbers from yesterday, that there's a handful of jails, prisons, even some of these juvenile um, detention centers that have seen little to no testing. Um, I'm curious. Uh, how you all are prioritizing um, testing at these facilities and what the schedule or, or long-term uh, plan is, uh, a date to wrap all this up would be um, for all that. Yes, sir. I, you know, I, I probably need a little bit of help, you know, you know, from the standpoint of uh, maybe, maybe Secretary Krause could jump in, but, but as I understand it, uh, you know, what, what we're planning, it, my notes say the Division of Corrections remains on track to expand enhanced testing to all facilities by June the 12th. So we still got a few days to go, you know, to be able to get all the facilities, but, uh, but I think we're moving along terrifically, you know, and, and like I said, we have uh, all the tests, throughout all the testing we ha we've, we've done, you know there are four there are four jails with a positive test in each in each one of them at this time, and uh, no cases of any juvenile you know positives or the community correction centers uh, you know and and I've just been updated we have six positives as of this time I told you we had four I'm sorry wait just one second I, I, I'm what now we have six facilities that are being tested today. I'm sorry. I thought we had six positives, but we don't. We have six facilities that are being tested today. So, uh, so again, I, I think, I mean, if you just step back and look at it and you just say just this, what state in the nation was first as far as testing all of our nursing homes? What state in the nation was first on testing all the assisted living or moving in that direction to get that done? And what state in the nation does not have a death at a correctional facility? And what state in the nation made the commitment to test everybody? Test everybody in all the correction, correctional facilities. And it's West Virginia. It's West Virginia. And these people are doing the work, and they're knocking it out of the park as far as the work they're doing. And, and you know, it's not perfect. There's no playbook for this, guys. There's no playbook. But I'll tell you, these people have done a heck of a good job. Thank you, Dave. Next, we'll go to David Beard with the Dominion Post. Hi, this is David Beard. Um, I had some interesting conversations over the weekend with people who are uh, skeptical, maybe even downright cynical about the, the pandemic. Uh, they say that governments are inconsistent about the pace of their reopening. Medical authorities are inconsistent about whether to wear masks and gloves and whatnot. And uh, so they wondered, you know, is this pandemic real? How bad is it? They're, they're not too worried about wearing masks themselves. Um, and I can see that if that becomes widespread, it could make this next phase that much more difficult. How do you respond to conversations like that? Oh, well, David, I, you know, I, I, I think the, the simple way to respond to it is, uh, you know, Scientists have proven forever, you know, that we, we're easily conditioned to a thought, you know, and, uh, you know, so, so in, in all that, you know, our conditioning from time to time can lead us to horrendously bad decisions. You know, there's been 110,000 people in this country that have died, you know, all of, the, all of the greatest experts in all of our land, if we have any confidence in our, in our government or our experts or the health communities or our doctors or scientists, all of them, all of them said this pandemic could be devastating beyond belief. And if you just think just for a second that every day, every single day we had an, an equivalency of five or seven airliners, you know, hitting the ground and all the people dying. We hauled them out and put them in refrigerator trucks over and over and over. In this great state, 
you know, you have been somewhat immune to that because of all the things, the buttons we've pushed and all the great, great, great work that the West Virginians have done. But let's absolutely not drift into this is, this is a lunar landing that never happened. You know, you've got to be kidding me. You have to be kidding me, really and truly, when it really boils right down to it. This, is, this has killed 110,000 Americans. And, and if we had not reacted, and all we had done is said, oh, no, it's just, it's, it's, it's not even real and everything, how many would have lost their lives? Millions? A few hundred thousand more? All those people have a name. All those people have loved ones. And really and truly, this has been real. It's not been any fun. And it's been tough on all of us from an inconvenience standpoint, an anxiety standpoint, the hours, the sleeplessness, it's tough. And so uh, I would say to all those that are standing out now and their Monday morning quarterbacks and their they're standing on the sidelines saying, well, I knew it wasn't going to be anything and everything. I would say to them, first of all, shame on them. And second of all, you know, let's absolutely not drift into Monday morning quarterbacking because uh, it's awfully, awfully easy, uh, you know, to sit back and do nothing and then say, well, I knew that's, that's the way it was going to be. But uh, I'm not in that boat. All right, thank you, David. Next, we'll go to Anthony Isaguar with the AP. Governor, do you think it's fair to say that you've used the last few weeks of these briefings to help your re-election effort more than you use them to inform the public about the virus? Anthony, I, I think it's fair to say that no matter what I would say, you're going to come up with something to complain about. You know, but, but I would tell you that, uh, you know, it is it is – it's not worth even answering. I mean, you know, every single thing that I report to you, I report to you as what has happened in every single area throughout our state. You know, you know, and if and and really and truly, if if I mean, you know, I was asked just a few minutes ago about going to my pa campaign headquarters. You know, if I was all wrapped up in the election stuff, and really and truly there's no point in being wrapped up in the election stuff, I've already told you exactly, you know, where I thought all that was going, but I have never, not been to our campaign headquarters yet either. All right, thanks, Governor. I will turn it back to you. Well, I, I just really, uh, I want to go back and thank uh, a little seven-year-old, and I hope and pray there's all kinds of calls from all across our state, you know, for families that would, would love to, to maybe have the opportunity to have this beautiful young, young kid in your, your, in your family. So uh, I, I called Landon a superstar. I hope to goodness he's still listening, and Landon, you are. I know you're even going to be greater and greater as we go forward. And all I want to do is just encourage everyone tomorrow to use your right. Go vote. Go vote. For crying out loud, you know, I'm not asking you to go vote for me. I'm asking you to go vote and everything. And that's what you should do in all the different races that we have all across our state. And, uh, and my last of my last is just this. I saw General Hoyer up there, and he didn't talk today, to, you know, but uh, he's been here every day. And, and I think, I just think of the greatness that our Guard has done and continues to do all across this state, in fact, all across this world. And so, uh, you know, General and all of those local health and all those first responders and all the people that have really, really been out right on the front lines, even as far as, as maybe the people that are working at the pharmacies or the grocery stores, Thank you from the bottom of my heart. You know, you've done great work. You've pitched numbers that nobody, nobody can believe. Way to go, West Virginia. Really proud of all of you. Thank you so much.